I think we are live. I will wait to make sure audio is going because I realized about two minutes ago my microphone was not set up in this room and it was a whole this whole thing. So I don't know if that is working yet. It looks okay, good. It looks like we're good on my end. So yeah, the problem with the wireless mic is it's generally charging in the office, not in here. And then when I plug it back in, the computer likes to reset everything, which it didn't do tonight. I don't know what's going on. Maybe that means it's gonna be a lucky night. Oh, but I'm still out of breath because I'm really out of shape. Um, to be <coughs> fair, the office is at the other end of the house completely. And I had to grab my tea because I had to make a new batch since I drank the all of the last one. Anyway, let's move on. Tonight, we are going to be working in pen pastels and colored pencil. I'm working on Cans and Me Tens. This is the gray paper, which I'm going to be changing to more of a kind of aqua type color, which the camera never picks up. I don't know why I keep choosing teal when I know the camera is not going to pick it up well. We've got this bunny. Reference photo is over at my website if you want to draw along with me. I'm gonna be doing my base layers with pan pastel and then I'll go on top of that with detail and colored pencil. I probably should lower this cause that is weirdly high. Give me one second to fix this. Uh, Matt's new job is going great. He loves the truck. He does not like how much time he's having to spend in it driving. That's the only negative thing about his new job. But other than that, it's going really well. He definitely likes it. So yay, but like there was one night it took him almost two hours to get home. So that's not a good time. Traffic by my house is a nightmare all the time. It's like California all over again. Okay, mostly because all the Californians moved here after us. We must be very popular. They followed us like 10 years later. Okay, so moving on. The pen pastels, I'm, pen pastels I'm going to be using, this is the, what, 20 set, I believe? Yeah, 20. And you can mix your colors very, very much like we do with paint. So if you're looking all the huge selection of colors available, don't feel like you have to have every single one. You'll see as I, I'm going to do tonight, we can mix a lot. And I like, I mean, I've been doing this for a couple of years and I still haven't, uh, haven't reset this up. Um, let's clear that out. <clears throat> I mean, I haven't added more to those colors. English Lisa, let's work on that tonight. So what I will be using are the soft tools. Are, these are the S-O-F-F-T little guys and they have the sponge covers and this is what I will be mixing my colors with. And I think this one, I'm gonna reuse this one because this one had green on it. I'm gonna be make, mixing a teal anyway, so I can just reuse that. And, oh, it looks like, oh good, auction seems to be working. Let me turn the volume up so I can see the Discord thing. If you have any questions tonight, leave them now. If it feels like I'm ignoring you, it's only temporary. I'm gonna answer all of the questions at the end of the video. We're also gonna be talking, I made a short this week about talking about why when you have prints, you want you don't wanna make your prints larger than the original. And I was surprised at how many people, and I'm sure that they, well, it was only a couple, but I'm sure that they were probably camera people, which is why they didn't understand this. They misunderstood having a good quality photo with the art art looking good. Two totally different things. If you blow that artwork up bigger than the original, it will look terrible. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about tonight. So that'll be kind of a fun thing to be able to actually show you samples I can't do in a live stream or in a short and definitely seem to be some miscon misconfusion like my grammar. Misinformation there or misunderstanding I guess is a better way to put that. So the colors that I'm going to be using tonight, I need to Move this down a bit, there we go. The colors I'm going to be using for the pan pastels are the phthalo blue and phthalo green. I'm gonna mix these two colors together because that is going to give me a teal tone. And I can actually pull probably some of this light blue in there and definitely going to be adding white. So I'm just going to use this tool. Let's pull this so you can see the palette a little bit better. Now you can see mine are a mess. They're about as messy as my watercolor pans, which I'm sure drives people crazy. But I'm just gonna mix right on there. Let's scooch this, nope, wrong direction, this way. So I'm just gonna mix those where I want them. I think a little bit more blue. And then coming over to the easel, let's see what color that looks like. Yep, that's pretty much exactly what I wanted. So we are good and I'm gonna fill this out. And you can bid on this. This guy is listed over on my website. The link is in the video, video description if you wanna bid for your chance to own this original. One of a kind, you'll be seeing it done live. Now I drew everything out first with my colored pencils and see how as I work over this, you really can't 
you can still see the white whiskers. So you're not going to erase those by going over them. See how nicely they stay in place? And if some of this, like you can see a little bit is more of the blue, some of it has more of the green, that's okay. I don't, I'm not trying to make that one complete solid color. Variation is just fine. I'm gonna mix some more of this. Whoops, not that, hitting the wrong button. So same thing, just gonna grab some of both of these. And back over to the easel. Now I would rather you overlap onto the bunny than go outside of him, like let's say here. See how I've got an area, if I work this, I've got a gap because you know a lot of people are too afraid to get the background color over the subject. And so they'll leave this halo effect where you, you've got a line where it shouldn't be. Go right over the bunny if you need to. I can still see the lines there. <coughs> you don't want that halo effect though. Now I don't mean making something intentionally lighter around the subject, that can look really cool, that glow effect. But that's I guess a different type of halo effect. But in this case, we don't want to leave a gap of just the paper show, blank showing. And we're gonna go right around that. See this mixture, the one I just bat did had a little bit more green, so it's got this gorgeous teal color in with it. So I'm just getting a really pretty soft transition from areas that have more blue, more white. Now, if you do not have pan pastels, you can just skip this and go straight when we start in with the colored pencil. Now I'm filling up higher, but the mat would actually cover a large portion of this, but I would rather fill too much than not quite enough. So that's how the mat, actually probably more like that is how the mat would hit. So up here really isn't gonna show, but it's better to fill in more than you need than have to go back later and fix it because you didn't quite have enough. So that one has a little bit too much green. I know I said I wanted variation, but that's a little too much. <clears throat> now, I like these a lot better than the smaller like blush applicator makeup type tools for applying it because you've got a lot more control. It's just much, much more comfortable to hold it. I've also tried using paint brushes to apply pan pastels. It does not work like at all. I've had people say, yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Try these. You'll know what I mean by it doesn't work. Like the difference is pretty huge. Usually when you use a paintbrush, you end up knocking more of the product off the paper than what sticks. So you're just wasting a ton of it. Another thing that I've had people ask quite a bit lately is do, why, or do I need to wear a mask or have a filter in the room because pastels? So here's the thing about pastels. In, there are a lot of like the, the chalkiness that dry from the, the pastel pencils, that gets in the air and you end up breathing that in and that is not super safe. And so a lot of people have had lung issues or I've read of it. Actually, let me back that up. I've not done the research, but I do trust the people who are talking about the issues with the pastels and breathing in that dust. I don't do anything for pan pastels because it's really not very dusty, so, which is why I can use them. I don't like working with pastels because of that dry chalkiness. It like, it actually freaks me out when it touches my skin, but also it makes a mess. This, like there's hardly any fallout. Like I just rubbed the bottom of my easel. I don't know if you can see. No, you can't see. There's barely any blue in my fingers and I just filled in this whole background. Like very, very little of this falls out. So I don't worry about pan pastels in the same way that I would worry about pastel pencils giving, uh, breathing that, that in. So that is something you wanna be aware of um, with pastels. Do more research, obviously I'm not giving you all the facts there, but people have asked what I do to protect myself from the pan pastel dust. There really isn't any. I don't experience much with dust at all. Now, I think I'm going to lighten just a little bit right in here. But I want to make sure that pulls and blends out. And just layer right on top of the paper. Yeah, that color is actually coming out really accurate. I'm surprised. Usually teals, it does not want to look right, but that looks pretty dang close. Like I'm impressed.
Now see how I'm getting some harsher lines in there? All I'm gonna do is take my paper towel. These are Viva paper towels, so it's very cloth-like. If you don't have this, an old t-shirt would be a good alternative. I'm gonna wipe some of this off so that this is more clean. And now I'm just gonna smudge that, soften that out. So I'm pretty much just taking a, bright, a dry sponge that doesn't have a lot of product on it, and that's gonna give me that nice, soft look so it, I don't have those harsher start and stop points, that streakiness that I was getting. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and start filling in the bunny. Now, I am going to use a combination of the color that I just did and white for the shadows for, for that. So let's actually, I can use what little is on here just to kind of go over that. And then I'll put white on top and then come back with more teal as needed. Basically what I'm doing right now is just cleaning my brush on the paper. Now, whatever color you go with on your background, that's the color you wanna do for the shadows on the bunny. So let's say you went with like a pale purple color. Then you would use that same pale purple for the shadows on the white. White is very reflective. It's gonna pick up what's around it. And that's a mistake a lot of people make or a challenge a lot of people have when they are working with white fur is, remember white is not true white. Like in this case, this bunny is actually pretty overexposed. So he's very white in a lot of areas, but not everywhere. Look at how many of the darker shadowed areas we've got, like right in here. I'm gonna pull more of that dark in this area. Now this photo came from Unsplash and the original, there's like some guy's leg in it and it was kind of a weird photo. They're looking down on him. He's on the floor indoors, like by a couch. This is an example of what you can do with pet portraits. If somebody has a photo like that, that's not super amazing, but you can turn it into something that it feels more artsy. It looks more like not somebody's. Yeah, um, boy, <laughs> we're having the same problem again with the boys in the same bed. Also, I moved your, let me fix your camera. What happened there? So they both dove to the same bed when I brought them in here because they get a treat when the live stream starts and now Gibson's over there all uncomfortable because Wade is sharing and Gibson doesn't like to share beds. So I guess that's a thing. I, you know what, maybe it's good practice for you, Gibson. I would save you, but you can learn that it will all be okay. That brother won't murder you if he lays next to you. Okay, so let's go ahead. I think I've probably wiped enough of this off now going lightly over this. Let's start pulling in some of the white. I've got plenty of, you can see this, my palette has lots of the blue in it, so some of that's gonna pick up anyway, which is fine. Now this guy's really, really soft, so I'm not gonna be putting a lot of individual brush marks in the white area. That's gonna help his coat seem more dense and soft. I mean, I'll obviously be putting some, but not a ton. If you put too many brush strokes on, an, on fur that you want to look really soft, you end up making it look wiry. I always think of zombie hair, like it's not been washed in a while. Turns out it's hard to get zombies to wash their hair. So it's just that dirty, greasy look, like if you try to put too much detail into fur that should look fluffy. more on there. I'm gonna be careful around that edge. I don't really wanna layer that into the background here because I can use my pencil for that later. It would be easier. And we're just gonna fill that guy in. He already looks so cute and like he just, I wanna pet him. How many of you guys have bunnies as pets? Now notice even here, look how where the, the fur, that line is right there, that was done with my polychromos and when I blend over it, it stays. So if you draw out your lines in colored pencil, when you blend over, you can be really sloppy, you can do a lot of blending like I'm doing here and it's not gonna mess up your, your art or your line drawing, so you're not gonna miss that. 
just going to turn the brush to the side here to get this thin light area. And then of course we've got the inside of the ear. And you can follow along with any medium. Really, you're just paying attention to where are your lights and where are your darks. If you can get your values in there right, it'll look about the same with most mediums. I've heard several people, it always makes me laugh, comment about why are you trying to make your oil paints look like acrylics or your acrylics look like oils or your colored pencil look like acrylics, just use acrylics then or whatever. Like they, a lot of people feel like a certain medium should look a specific way. No, in my mind, and you can do however you want, it's art that you're free, but I really do believe that art it doesn't matter what medium I'm, I'm working in, that shouldn't be a difference. It should have my style, the way that I do my lights and darks, the way that I draw things out. It should have me in there, not the medium. The medium is not what defines me. It's the artwork and how that comes out. And again, it doesn't matter what medium I, I work in, it should pretty much be the same all the way through. Okay, I'm gonna pull, let's get some pinks in there. So I'm gonna use a little bit of this reddish brown, a little bit of pink, a little bit of white. I don't want too much pink. Ooh, that's pink. Let's dab some of that off on my paper towel. There we go, that's a much softer look. You know, a lot of people will define themselves and their art by the medium. I don't do that, I define it by the art. The medium is just a tool. There's a certain look that I'm going for in most cases. Now, the exception for me, see this is where I was saying it, it depends on you. The exception for me on that, I like my charcoal pieces. You can make charcoal look super realistic. I actually like the sketchy look with that. It just, the nature of charcoal, it's easy to work that way. And I really like that look. So like I said, it depends on everybody. Now I'm not gonna put a bunch of black in here. Actually, I'm gonna switch. Let's fill in his eye. I'm gonna grab this soft tool with the, the triangle point. I actually prefer this to, I just tossed it, these ones for fine detail. I can get smaller detail because of that point. Actually, there we go, now you can see. That point is gonna give me finer detail even though overall it's larger. One second, let me let my friend know I am live streaming. Okay, and now I'm gonna come through with brown. Now, notice I don't have a good rich chocolate brown in this this color set, so all I do is mix my red oxide or burnt sienna, whichever color that is, and some black, and that will give me a really nice chocolate brown, like really nice. I don't even have this color, but look how I can mix it. And this is the color I think I'm gonna do for a lot of the base. Actually, my other brown might be better for some of the base. So I change my mind constantly. I think a lot of people think that as artists that we know going in exactly what everything's gonna look like. Heck no, I'm making that up as I go along. I'm changing my mind constantly on what I think will be easier. I'll clean this eye up and define everything once I go on with my pencils. Oh, we've got a super chat from Rob said, this should help put the puppies sort out the beds. Glad to hear Matt's enjoying his new job, his new whipping job. Thank you so much. You, oh, look at them. They're over there licking their lips. They heard the word super chat now, apparently. Look at Gibson's ready to, to dive. He's like, I really want to jump, but I don't want mom to get mad at me. Okay, you get a treat. There was a super chat. Thank you, Rob. Oh, got the good treats, huh? I had to wait all week to get more of these ones. These are your favorites. They smell weirdly good. Is it weird that I think a dog treat smells good? It smells like beef jerky. Okay, stop smelling the dog treats. Back up, ready? Okay, there you go. Ah, easy, you can't just take it. That was much nicer. Wade just is like chomp. He bites me all, but like not, he's not breaking the skin, but he's got me enough times like in the nail bed where I'm like, okay, that hurts. We have to work on this now. So we've been working on it, huh, bad cow? Okay, go lay down in separate beds, hopefully this time. That camera is weirdly bright because that's really dark in that corner. I don't know why it's got everything that light. 
Kind of odd, but okay, I'm not messing with it. Lay down, Gibson. Gibson, down. All the way. He's like, but I would like some more, please. It was really tasty. Now I'm sad because I don't have more. Okay, I narrate for my dogs all day. Like this is what my entire day is like, is me narrating what I think my dogs are saying. This is what happens when you work from home. Okay, now. Um, paintbrush, focus, Lisa. So I'm gonna take this, we've got those dark areas in. This brown is a much softer, kind of a neutral, medium brown. Let's go ahead and pull some of that guy in here. It really doesn't matter which brown you go with, honestly. It, it's an issue of values. Are your darks dark and if your light's light enough? As always, that is what's gonna make your work look realistic. So if you're having a hard time with your work, you're looking in, you're like, it always looks cartoony. It just doesn't look super realistic, even though I put this all the detail in, even though my drawing, my foundation drawing was right, but it still looks cartoony. It's probably because your values aren't there. Your darks aren't dark enough. Your lights aren't light enough. And this is the smooth side of the Cans and Me Tens. I've worked on both sides when doing this, but I'm really starting to like the smooth side better, even with pen pastels. In the past, I went with the rough side so that it stuck better. But it turns out these pastels stick so well to both sides. Yeah, it's gonna stick more to the rough side. But because, you know, balancing things out so that your detail, you, you can still get really smooth detail with a colored pencil. No, I'm, I'm going to be going over with that. I've been leaning more towards doing the I can't multitask, my brain keeps shutting down. Words are hard. But I've been leaning more into the soft side um, and really liking the effects that I've gotten. This is why, I, like I am in love with pan pastels. Look how fast I just got my entire base layer in there of almost everything. I don't care if these spots are exact. Same thing when I start with the pattern on his face. I don't care if it's exact, but let's say you're doing a pet portrait for somebody. If you're doing someone's cat or someone's bunny, the markings need to be exact. Don't take artistic liberties there. I've told this story a few times, but there were several years ago, there was an Italian Greyhound forum I was on, and there was a girl that did a portrait of a, one of the Italian greyhounds who was like well known, like this, the owner posted all the time, so everyone knew who this dog was. And she was really interesting, uh, pied with the bl blue spots and, and white spots, kind of like a blue and white cow print. Super cute. Her name was Eloise. But the artist took a few too many artistic liberties on which side she mirrored it, so the spots were on the wrong side. And the owner, when she gave it to her, the owner was talking to me and she's like, what am I supposed to do with this? That's not my dog. Make sure when you do portraits, if it's of somebody's animal, do not take artistic liberties on where the spots go. Here, no one's gonna know the difference because I don't know who this bunny belongs to. And again, this reference photo came from Unsplash. You can find tons of photos on Unsplash and Pixabay that are royalty free that you can use in your own artwork, even to sell, make prints. You don't have to worry about that. You don't wanna just go and find random photos on Google that many of those, most of those, I mean, assume if it doesn't say that it's royalty free, it is, somebody owns the copyright to that. So you could get in trouble doing it in your artwork. And I know people will always argue and say, oh no, it's just inspiration. Well, does it look like the photo? If so, if it can be identified as such, you do not want to take somebody's photo. Especially in this case, we've got Unsplash and Pixabay. There's plenty of royalty free stuff. Or wildlifereferencephotos.com is a great place to get, get reference photos. Or my Patreon, I give out, if you're on the $4 tier, it's five, free um, animal or flower reference photos a month. If you're on the higher tiers, it's 10. So you don't need to just go steal stuff off the internet. We, it is so easy to find things that you can legally use and not even have to worry about being sued for violating somebody's copyright. And you may think there's a lot of people out there who will say things like, well, as long as you change 30% of it, it's fine. No, no, it's not. That's not how it works. That's not a thing. Um, if it's at all identifiable as the original photo or the original artwork that you copied, you could get in a lot of trouble. So why even mess with it? Like why press, oh, I think I can get away. Why? You can, there's legal great photos available for you that you can use in your work. So you, I would definitely avoid Taking something in yours. I mean, I would avoid that anyway, but 
maybe it can scare some people into not doing it. Don't be a thief. I'm going to take that same brown and do some of the shading with this. Actually, I'm going to switch brushes though. This one's a little bit too harsh. So let's take some of that. Get this under the bunny's chin. Now, if I go over with the colored pencil and I decide I want to soften more out with the pan pastels, I can do that. This isn't like when I work with watercolor that you wouldn't want to put watercolor back over colored pencils. So here I can go back and forth. It's not a problem. Making this a little bit darker so that when I come on top with the white pencil, it'll show up better. Do I want to put the black? I guess I may as well put some of the black in now. I'll still have to go over it with colored pencil to get it as dark as I want, but we can put a little in. And then just pulling a bit through here. This is what I'm talking about. If you're doing a pet portrait that is somebody's animal, make sure these black areas would need to be in the exact right spot. Mine don't need to be, so I'm not going to spend too much time perfecting those. That's not going to make it any better um, in this case. But if it's somebody's actual animal, then it matters. Darken that up a bit. I don't want to go too crazy because I do want some of those lights will show through on the later stage. Of course, we've got a lot of the dark in here. And notice how I'm holding this to the side. I'm twisting it to get thinner lines instead of the thick ones. It's very similar to using a palette knife. We have not done a painting with a palette knife in a really long time. Let me know if you'd like one of those for one of the live streams. They use a lot of paint, but man, are they fun. Okay, I'm gonna call that good with the pan pastels and I think I'm gonna switch over then. Actually, I take it back. I do wanna get a little bit more of an orangey color, just a little in some of the brown. Probably isn't going to make that big of a difference in the end, but I've decided I wanted it there. Okay, good enough. Now, let me put these away and actually the pencils, I pulled out a bunch of pencils that I think should work instead of grabbing my entire set. Let's put this somewhere safe. That seems like a bad idea in how to break your stuff. I'm going to go put this somewhere else. Be right back. Although I guess I'm bringing you with me. cooled down enough to drink yet. Let's find out, or I might just burn my face off. Either way, it'll be entertaining. Mm. Perfect temperature. Let's slide some of these pencils over here. I've just put out that, actually, I didn't intentionally pull out the pink. It was from a different project, but that will work. Oh, I need glassine. So I don't want to rest my hand on the actual artwork. Not only would I smudge it, but it would also get people juices on the canvas. Or the people juices, not archival. So, put, there it is. Using is a product called Glass. I'm using tonight should be listed in the video description if I did my job right. Oh. Somebody mentioned the, the link that I've been using. So, okay, the tape that I use around here is acid-free, it's pH neutral. This is what it looks like on the inside. I've gotten this before from Amazon. I've also gotten it from Jerry's. I don't know if it was if Blick has had it, but um, it's a pH neutral tape. So anytime you use masking tape, even when you remove it, it leaves residue behind. So this being pH neutral, in theory, should be totally safe. Um, again, in theory, I don't know, I'm starting to question some of these companies, but looking at you, you are in your dirty, dirty lies about being archival. Anyway, so 
V, I'm gonna start with I, so I'm just gonna map this out or block it further in. Um, anyway, somebody pointed out to me, I think it was last week, and so I removed most of the links that I could find. I need to go through and remove any of them and check. They had commented that it was no longer saying that it was acid-free, the same item. They changed the description, they've removed that. Now, if you've gotten yours and it has the pH neutral, I mean, if it says the inside still, that is fine, um, then it should be the same one, but it looks like they changed the description and I don't know if that means the product actually changed. I have no idea what happened and I have not found an alternative yet, so I'll have to look for one. Um, you may have to go through Jerry. I wanna say it was Jerry's was the one I'd gotten when it wasn't on Amazon, so just something to be aware of. Okay, and again, this guy, if you want to bid on him, that link is in the video description. What am I looking for? Black. I've got black, let's get some white. Gonna need a little bit of a pale blue. Oh, I did not get, oh, it'll work. Good enough, I'll just lighten you with the white. I can probably make that work. Nope, I'm going to need, no, yeah, decisions. That should be fine. Mostly I'm just too lazy to go find it. Okay, I'm gonna sharpen that pencil. Oh, before I start though, I do need, for getting my job, I need to mist this with my Spectrafix before I move on. So if, if Okay, I say you need to, I'm going to, it's gonna help mine to be more archival to last long term, but if you don't have any of this on you, don't worry too much about it, you're probably still fine. This is gonna help seal the pan pastels down so at last it's more archival, like long term. There's going to be less likely of this like falling off the paper over time. So that's the thing with pastels. Over the years, they do just kind of fall. Like if you mat it, you'll see a little dust of the pastel that will fall off of it, especially if you do not use some sort of a, a fixative. So this is what I'm using. And this is Spectrafix, and I have it in a fine mist sprayer. And I'm gonna hold this out at a distance and just lightly go over it. Not too much. If you go too heavy, you will create heavy, heavy droplets, and that's not what I'm looking for. I'm also going to take a hairdryer and dry that to speed things along, but just a light mist is all you need. And if any of these leave heavier droplets, just take your, your blending tool and blend right over it. So if it does leave a heavy droplet, it's not the end of the world, you can fix it, just blend over it and then do it again. But the fine mist sprayer will help that not to happen as much. Although I will say, I think mine is clogging because that came out weird, like it felt, no, yeah, I think it was just clogged. So anyway, that is the product that I used to spray that. And now I'm going to put the paper back over here. And let's start with his little eye. So let me blow up my reference photo so I can really see what I'm doing here. He's got that curve. And he's got the white of his eye exposed and then black on the outer edge. And the reason I'm going with polychromos here is that it's going to hold a sharper point because it's a harder lead. I can push harder. I can also sharpen the pencil to a finer point. So for something like this, where I want really clean edges, it is definitely the way to go. And I am burnishing. I'm pushing pretty hard here because I am not going to be putting a bunch of layers over this. If I knew I needed to blend and do a lot of layering over, I would want to go with lighter layers so that I didn't damage the tooth of the paper. But here, that's unnecessary. So... I am pushing quite a bit harder. Now really look at the details on your reference photo. We've got the little eyelids. We really want to make sure that we're capturing all of that. All these little lines. Pull that pupil way out. And look at the shadow here, round this off. And then we're gonna start making that eye look very three-dimensional. This dark up here is going to be cast from that upper lid, or a shadow cast from the upper lid, so get that in there. I'm 
going to thin this out, this line here, by pulling the black in on either side. Now, right now, the brown of his eye is a little bit too light, so I'll lightly go over that. And I'm going to go ahead and get that highlight in. This is where I was couldn't make up my mind. I think if I go with a darker blue, because I already had it out, and then put light on top, that'll give me a good result. But I want blue right on the edge of the highlight. And we'll blend the white over it. I'm using the white polychromo so it's not too opaque. I'll use my other ones where I want it to be more opaque, but not here. I want that glassy look. I'm going to take a brown and just go right in between the black and the, the brown, or the, two, the iris and the shadow of the black on the side there. So this area and this area, I'm bringing them together. But wow, that was weirdly hard to communicate. Look at the really big people. Kind of like an owl there. And then round this, make sure this is nice and round. Mine's a little bit choppy there, so I'm gonna smooth this out. Really get that circle in there. Okay, he's already so cute with just putting his eye in. And now let's go ahead and start working on the fur. Let me zoom this in a bit. Let's see if I can bring this camera a bit closer. There we go. Again, if you have any questions, just leave those now and I'll be answering those at the end of the stream once the lesson is done. And let's go ahead and start just moving our way out from the eye there. So a lot of black. And I'm just gonna make the little lines going the same direction as the fur. Really watch this, that that is going the right direction. These are not just random confetti lines all over the place. You just start putting random lines and it is not gonna look cute. I don't need every line to be exact. Close is close enough, but they do need to be close. Like don't just make them up. You wanna spend more time looking at your reference photo than you do your actual artwork. A lot of people make the mistake. They look at the reference photo and then they, they just go to town on the artwork without looking at the reference photo again, going by memory. Yeah, it's not gonna come out looking very good that way. Spend more time just constantly glancing at that photo. I'm pushing pretty hard to get these lines to really show up. Again, still using the polychromos white versus one of my more opaque whites because I want the thinner line that this gives me and I'm not trying to make it super opaque. So that also adds to that choice. Now notice the fur marks, how they start going in almost rows. Now don't make straight lines. You're not trying to make little like man-made fences, but see how we get a row and then another row. That is a big deal on the fur. And if you're following along, if you're doing the group challenge over on Patreon for this month, I, we're doing a landscape. And I showed you in that one, this is what I'm talking about, those rows. It's the same thing with fur as it is in the landscape where you get these sorts of rows in the fur or in the case of the landscape in the grass or even the clouds. Now I'm using the brown. I don't want to just use black for everything. I want to make sure I keep that for some of those darkest darks. Now I do, I'm going to grab my more opaque white here. I want to pull a little bit higher with this and this one is going to show up more. This is my Karen dot, or I'm sorry, my Derwent Lightfast. That is going to be a bit more opaque than the, um, the polychromos. I'm gonna break that up a little bit. And if yours is not perfect, don't worry about it. It does not need to be exact to still look awesome. Unless you're doing somebody's pet, then you need to be more exact. There are exceptions to everything. I need a peach type color. Do I have one? Oh, what are you? You may be close. This one is sanguine. Kinda, that actually would work. Yep, that works. So this is a really good point. The color that, if I wanted to be more exact, would be more of a pink tone. 
I don't need it to be exact, but I do need my values about right. This works. This is close enough. It's kind of a an orangey tone, but it absolutely works for what I needed. We get so caught up worried about the exact perfect color. The color is not what is going to make the work look more real realistic. It's the values. Are your lights light enough? Your darks dark enough? And of course, have an accurate drawing to start with. That also helps. Well, I've got this more opaque white, I can use that. Push a little bit harder on the really bright white area. And every time I'm pausing and nothing is happening, it's because I keep looking at that reference photo. Oops, and then I'm gonna throw my pencil. I tried to escape. I'm not pushing that hard, you don't need to run away. And let's just quickly go through here and start getting these marks. I'm gonna come through, we've got a line here that's really dark, that deeper shadow in between the clumps of really dense fur. And again, we, it moves in rows, not straight lines though. There is a difference. If you've got questions, leave those now. I'll be answering those at the end of the stream. I'm just gonna pull a few little speckles of the really dark in between where I've got the white and the brown. Another definite row here. Also, these lines are not perfectly straight. Every single little line I'm making is at least slightly curved. It has a much more natural feel. There's not a lot in nature that's going to be completely straight. Straight are your more man-made stuff, buildings and fences and cars and stuff. But when you get into wildlife or nature landscapes, everything, even like tree trunks are usually at least slightly curved and bent. So you can get a much more natural feel with that, just slight, slight curve. When you do a bunch of perfectly straight lines, you end up with something that has a, a very stiff feel to it. Not very natural. Yeah, the, the fur marks, how here they're going back this way, here it starts to curve around. Really watch that direction. This will make such a difference in your artwork it doesn't even matter that the technique is perfect. It doesn't matter if everything's perfectly smooth, but if you can get that where you're really capturing the feel there, it will make such a difference in what your work looks like. We often get really hung up on the perfect technique, the perfect blending, the perfect everything. And in the end, most viewers aren't that impressed by that. What they're looking at, your values, your contrast, your things like this, are, is the fur going in the right direction? Focus more on those. Don't worry so much about getting and learning the perfect blending technique. I mean, we want to add that in too, obviously. We'd like to learn how to do everything well, but they're not nearly as important as how much we like value we put on those, those things. The average viewer cares about the idea you had in your painting, and they're drawn to having really good contrast, your lights and your darks, a good design. We tend to focus on the wrong thing and just get so worked up on that that we lose sight of the big picture. Here we've got a lot of little short ones. So I'm just gonna go a little bit softer. And now here, this is gonna be one where the ear is a bit more velvety, the short, short fur. Let that grainy, gritty look you get of the, of the paper that I often avoid. This is a case where I wanna leave that. It makes that look really short, very um, velvety type fur. We've got dark right around the edge there. A little bit moving in, I'm gonna need to move my paper in. Now once we get through the head and the ears, the rest goes very, very quickly. The majority of the work and the majority of the detail is being done right around the head. That's where we really wanna focus 
the, our detail that will help keep the viewer's attention in this area. And then we'll just soften out and calm that detail down as we move away from the face. Really dark in here so I can fill that in. I'm doing burnishing and pushing harder. I'm just gonna go right over this dark area. Again, if it's a little bit grainy and gritty, that's perfect for this look. Use that to your advantage. I think of it almost like dry brushing with, with acrylics. You often hear me talk about how much I dislike that technique. It just doesn't look good. See, this is kind of that same feel with colored pencil, but sometimes dry brushing looks good and sometimes the same with your colored pencils. And this is one of them. Take my white, I'm using the polychromos again so it's not as opaque, that gives me a softer look. I'm also going to pull a bunch of those little ones in between what I did here. This area is a lot darker than what I've got. I actually want to go get my pan pastels and fix that. It'll be easier than doing it with, oh no. Actually, let me see. Maybe I want to put more of them. Pan pastels would be faster, but, oh, I like that color. Fine, I'll just do this. Pan pastels would be like one swipe and done. And I am gonna use a bit of OMS to blend this out. Actually, I'm going to pull a couple other colors over that. What else do I have out right now? Ooh, this one's perfect. This gives me that purpley color. This is light aubergine, aubergine. I don't know. I can't say words. That one is Karen Josh Luminance. Just a bit more purpley. And then we've got this light area that comes through here. Actually, you know what, I don't even need, to, I'm trying to avoid using OMS because the dry time slows me down for what, for getting something like this done. But look how nice that blended. I'm just gonna lightly go over it and burnish then with the white. You also have some colorless blenders that can work okay. They work, actually, believe it or not, I don't say this often, but it's one of the things I actually like better with Prismacolor, their colorless blender. I liked better than the Caran d'Ache. It's okay, but let me see if I've got one over here. Oh, I have the Lyra. Rembrandt Splendor. That is working just fine. There we go. We're going to use that tonight. So this one is, I don't have that in the video description. I'm going to need to add it, but the Lyra Rembrandt Splendor. So it's one of the tools you can use. That's kind of like a colorless blender sort of thing. And they've got the Splendor and then another one. One of them's harder than the other and it's been so many years since I used them. I don't remember which one was which. I should probably do a review video on those. I don't even think I have. I'm just lightly going over that. You could do white. It'll just lighten it up if you add white for burnishing. But that worked out a lot better than I thought it would. Okay. I want to soften the transition here with white. I'm going to move my pencil back and forth this way so I get that rounded look of the ear where those lines are. Now we're gonna come back through and start putting some little hairs in. Actually, I'm switch over to my polychromos white. That one is going to be more, a little bit more translucent, but harder lead, smaller details. Works well for this. That white was standing out a bit too much for the hairs I wanted to create in here. So I'll just switch that over. Just a little hairs and I'll come back through with the black as well. But while I've got this color in my hand, we can go ahead and throw some of the little guys in here. Okay, we've got the black now. Let's come in between little teeny guys, little details. Then 
notice that the ear takes longer than the eye and the eye is like your main focus. That is always the case when doing portraits. I will usually start with the ear because it takes so long and I'll end up wanting to rush through it otherwise. In many cases, especially like a rose ear and a dog, like an Italian greyhound or a greyhound, that fold is just so much work. So I will often do that first just to get it out of the way so I don't rush later. That looks really cute. Let's go ahead and this ear is not as in focus and it's much softer, shorter fur back here. So I'm just gonna create this blotchy look. I can see where I did not do a good job cropping. If you've got this reference photo, there's like this pink blotch there. Yeah, put black over that. That's just a bad crop job on my part. From bad Photoshop. You do not have to be good at Photoshop. And I just got, I don't want to fix this now. I got a little bit of black smudge right there. I'll go over it with the pen pastel again later. But look at the side of my hand it has color on it. Watch that. I was starting to touch that or I must have just brushed against it and that left a mark. Now it's easy to fix, but it is something I will have to go back and fix later. So make sure you've got your hand on that glass scene. Now this, we do have a lighter area. This was not from bad Photoshop. This area gets really dark. We want this to be really dark and that white patch will then look that much brighter. If you're working in an area and you feel like you just can't get it dark enough, it's because what's next to it in many cases is not light enough yet. Or the reverse, if the light area isn't light enough, you just cannot get a light to stand out bright enough. Make what's next to it darker. That will hype up that contrast. Okay. You know what, I think I want to pull a little bit of a grayish tone into this shadow. There we go. So this one is just polychromos Payne's gray. Just along this edge and it's going to make that inner part of the ear look a little bit deeper. And then I'm going to take a little bit of white up here again. Let's lighten this one. That'll help the inner portion of the ear to look deeper and darker too. Okay. Yeah, it looks better. Now let's come over to the front of his snoot. Come on, tape, let go. Okay, so we've got the nose. We've got this dark area here, and then we've got some pink right around it. So we do have a pink out. This one is Rose Carmine. Just right along the edge of his little nose. And then the rest will be the white. This is very dense fur. There is not a lot of detail there, but we do have the little hairs sticking out over the background here. Notice that they're all just slightly curved. Looks like got a little eyelash comes from about here. I'm just going over what's already there. I can see them, but I want to brighten those up. And then I'm going to switch over to the Derwent Luminance. Uh, Derwent Light Fast, sorry, white, so that this will show up even more. Let's really brighten this up. Move that pencil in the direction of the fur. Very important. And I'm not trying to make a solid area. I want some of the darker areas with that blue and the, the browns that I did earlier. I want some of that to show through. Take this white, this brighter white, and get the ends of some of these little rows of fur. See how I'm hitting the outer edges, that little feathery look? 
right in here. Oh, careful, I'm starting to touch my hand again to the paper, so let's slide that back over for this area. Now the polychromos here won't show up as well, so that's why I wanted to switch to a more wax-based pencil for this area. And I'm mostly getting the ends. I'm not just putting lines everywhere. Now these colors, I really like this one versus uh, Solid White Bunny because this is actually easier to make look good. Yeah, we spent some extra time getting the detail, but it's also easier with that level of detail to make look good. It is often very hard to make something that's more simple look good because there's not a lot to hide your mistakes. Here, it gets so busy. I've got so many little hairs. It looks like it just, well, it looks good. It's easier to make that look good. Here, as we move out here, it is a lot more difficult. I mean, not a super big deal here because in contrast to this, it all works together really well. Now here we also move into rows. Let's see how this rounds this way and it fans out. So my brush strokes here or my pencil strokes are moving down and they fan out. Now they're moving up, round that off. See how this turquoise color from the background is mi mixing in some with the white? Good. I don't want that to be solid white. This photo was overexposed. Let those background colors work in with your subject. Here where it's softer or shorter, I'll just do little circles and then move back. Actually, what color do I want to do for that? Probably the gray. Just a little bit. I'm not pushing hard because I'm not trying to make this super dark. But see how that fur just keeps changing directions. One of the biggest mistakes I often see people who are newer to pencils and trying to get the detail in is they put the detail, they put just as many lines, they'll put more lines than I did, but they're not going the right direction. They're just lines for the sake of lines. That won't work. It has to be the right direction. It will look much better if it's less lines, like not even as detailed, but the right direction. Lines for the sake of lines is not usually gonna be a good plan. Notice again that direction. And I will post a high resolution photo of this over on my website. So if you're following along later, you can go download that and see the way that I did my, my pencil strokes, if that helps. Now here where it's a little bit more soft, I'm just gonna move to little circles in between that. Again, switch out to longer strokes. Let that darker blue, don't cover it all the way. Look at those shadows now that I've got in there. And you've got, I think another hour or so, you can bid on this guy, it's over on my website. Now here the first starts getting a lot longer and this is where the whole project starts going way faster. Let's switch over to the polychromos for those whiskers. Oh, I think he's so freaking cute. Whoops, broke the pencil. You know I sharpened it a lot if I broke polychromos. Move that paper over again. Oop, too much. Actually, I'm not even gonna tape it. I'll just move it by hand, hold it in place, move it as I need to, because I'm gonna be moving back and forth a bit too much for that to be practical to tape down. I think a lot of people too, they'll make one or two pencil strokes and it looks like fur, it looks great, but then they just repeat the same thing so much. Look at your photo. 
promise you it will make things better. And if anybody is saying that their work comes out better when they don't look at their reference photo, that's because they're not very good at copying a reference photo. So that's why they didn't think it looked as good because they aren't good at it. So when they compare it, it's like, oh, it doesn't look like my photo at all. Yeah, because you need to improve, but you're going to improve by looking at a reference photo because what your brain is telling you it looks like is not what it looks like. Our brains lie to us all the time. Let me get a bit more solid in here because it's really soft. And we need to get some of these darks a bit deeper for the shadow. This brown that I'm using is burnt umber. Burnt umber? Huh. I would have thought that was more like a raw umber. Okay. That little whisker had a dark area in it. So I'm going to come back through here using my polychromos because that's softer. I'm going to go back to the luminance because that was too thin of a line for what I was doing there. You don't have that problem that often. Usually it's harder to get the thicker lines. And then we've got another row. So this one comes, it follows this and it comes down like that. Back up, back down. Focus on the ends more than the center here, the end of that little row. And then we've got another row right below it on his jaw, like by his jaw and neck where that breaks up. But see how I'm leaving that little bit of a shadow here. I'm not filling it in all solid. And this all moves out of focus, so I don't even need to put colored pencil there. We'll leave a lot of that as the um, pan pastels. So here's Sanguine, and I'm gonna go right over some of this with the brown. Let's pull some of the darker brown in as well, and we'll also come in with the black. And notice I'm not putting anywhere near the level of detail as I did up here, because this is not where my focus is. This is where we want it to soften out. We want some detail, just not this level of detail. Okay. Look how cute he looks. Oh my gosh. This is one of my favorites so far, I think, that we've done with the Pan Pastel colored pencil mixture. I don't know, I liked them all, but this one's, maybe just because it's a bunny and I like bunnies. So this starts to soften out. We want the hint of fur, but not super defined because he's not, we don't want him to have zombie fur everywhere. Same thing here, just loose hint of that fur. We're not gonna do everything. I'm just looking at my reference photo, where are some of those highlights? Don't invent highlights either. You can take the highlights that are in your reference photo and make them brighter, absolutely. I almost always do that, hype up that contrast. But don't invent new highlights that aren't there. If, if you do, you completely change the underlying bone and muscular structure of the subject and it's kind of scary looking. He 
And if you have a photo that's just terrible, sometimes like someone gives you a black lab and it's just solid black mass, go find a photo of a good lab and or a good photo, a good photo of a lab. There, that came out right. And um, just copy where those highlights are in that case. But don't just invent them is my point. Like you want it to be accurate. We move out really soft, just that hint of, of detail. This fur is now changing. So the, this spot, they move down this way a bit more. As we move here, it starts curving towards the front of his chest. I've got to be careful. I've obviously been touching the side of that. That is not good habits. You start smudging stuff and getting people juice on your artwork. I need to start being more careful and move this. Oh, speaking of, I ordered stickers. So those who should have gotten your postcards in March, so those would be the February ones. They always go a month after. I didn't send them yet because the $19 ones, I ran out of stamps, or not stamps, uh, stickers. So I did order some and they are an octopus that says people ink is not archival. So I thought it was hilarious. They're actually one of my favorite stickers I've done in a while. So those will be coming soon. I apologize. Those are late. But it's worth it because they're really good. Here, it's just more solid. Now to soften this up, I may go back over some of this area once I get the lines in with a bit of Pam Pastels because it'll tone down the lines that are getting a bit harsh. But I still want the hint of lines, so that may be my way to soften that. Soften, soften, whatever. See how it's just a little bit, like it's not a lot in there. And the bottom there. I wanna make sure this white is overlapping those darker spots. Now his spots are quite a bit darker than what I've got mine here, but I really don't wanna draw all of the view to the side body. I'd like the darkest darks to stay up here, so I'm not gonna go any darker on him there. And if that was a pet portrait, I wouldn't make the same call. But in this case, I'm gonna leave those pretty light. And down in this area, it all gets cut off by the mat, so I'm not gonna go crazy down there. And then if you bid on this one, it you can choose, oh, I may have screwed it up. Um, there should be an option though, if I did it right, that you can pay $15 if you want me to mat it. Otherwise, just go to like wherever you get mats. They're usually like five, $6 and you can mat it yourself. It's very easy to do. I just have to charge more to cover my cost of the mat and the shipping is actually what gets really expensive because it goes up a size. There we go. I want to start getting those more clumps, not just a bunch of lines. Like here is just a bunch of lines. Let's start breaking that up. Should be about it. And then I'm gonna do the rest coming back on top with a bit of pan pastels. Oh my gosh, he is so cute. Okay, let me grab the pan pastels. Move these pencils out of the way. While I grab those, the boys have their usual message. Without treats. These puppies are so sad.
your Patreon pledge of only $4 or more gives them cookies of happiness. Act now and the bad cow gets a treat too. Oh, and you also get over 300 art lessons and a new one every single week, plus other rewards. Sign up at patreon.com slash lockery. Okay, so now we are headed over, where, where's the, there we go. So we've got the pan pastels back again, and where did I put my, here they are. Maybe, there's one of them. What did I do with my other soft tools? Oh, I found it. So I'm actually going to use a new, I'm gonna flip this sponge over because this side is just too dirty to get much with the white. This might tear because it's an older one though. Eh, it actually went on okay. No, it sort of tore. I just have to be sort of careful. You can see the back end of that ripped, but we'll grab that. And I'm just gonna pull a few highlights right over so it softens that out. See how we still are moving even with the pan pastels and those clumps and clusters. And I can use the same thing with my Spectrafix on top of all of this. The Spectrafix works with colored pencil and the pan pastels just fine. Now, if I do something with just colored pencil, I don't use a fixative over it, it doesn't need it. But it's just because of the pan pastels that I will, will be using that fixative. So if you're just doing colored pencil, don't even worry about that. One of the things that's so nice about Spectrafix versus a lot of other fixatives is many of those will darken the color. So like the white that I'm putting, if you put that with Spectrafix, it will oftentimes completely darken it up and you have to go right back over it once it dries. The Spectrafix that rarely, rarely happens, like you have to put that on really heavy to do that. So if you're just careful, you don't need to worry about it. Not like with most fixatives I've used with pastels anyway. Same thing with charcoal. It doesn't really dark it or darken it much. If it does, just go over it again. But if you, you use a light hand, it shouldn't be. There we go. Actually, this area looks really blue on the, fo the camera, but it's not in person. That's much more um, even. Okay, now to sign it, what you wanna do, this is the same type of mat that I would use. Um, so if you, whoever buys this, if you decide to do, um, to, to have me mat it, I will give you one that's clean, this one's dirty. But I wanna hold the mat up to it. Let's actually back this up a little bit. But I always want to check where to sign it. Don't just look at this, because this is a nine by 12 paper. I'm actually gonna cut some of this off before I mat it. But I don't wanna just sign at the bottom because once the mat is put positioned over that, that mat is like, cuts, it's gonna lose a big chunk of this. So I wanna center that where I want that to be, like that, and then go ahead and sign it. Let's use brown for this. Because now, that signature, look at where, if I would have signed it at the bottom, you can't really see it because it's light, but it's, I mean, that's a big difference in that, the location of that. So that's why you always wanna put the mat in it, account for that. The same thing, let's say you're doing an acrylic painting, you wanna do the same thing. Don't sign at the bottom edge of that canvas because if the person decides, the customer decides to frame it, the frame will overlap just a little bit. It's not as extreme as you would have here, but you still wanna leave a little bit of a space. And in this case, I'm gonna frame it into, it would go into an eight by 10 mat. So a, the overall size is 11 by 14 is the frame it would go into, but the in, inner sec, wow, let's see if I can speak. The intersection is going to be an eight by 10, so that this paper overall is too big. We want to, like this is all being chopped and then just a little bit down here is. So there is the finished bunny. Let me see if I can move the camera a little bit better so you get a better angle. 
where you're looking straight at him. Oh, I am so happy with how he came out. He is so adorable. Ah, okay. Let's move this back out of the way. Come on, out of the way. There we go. Okay, so the if you've got the, the questions, you can leave those. If you haven't already, I will be coming through and answering those tonight. And I want to go over, let's turn this down. I don't need that now. Um, so I had mentioned earlier, I made a, a YouTube shorts where I talked about you don't want to make prints larger than what your original is. And a couple of people were arguing with me, no, no, you just, it's the setting of the cameras as long as it's like 300 DPI or 600 DPI, whatever DPI you use and, and this and that. No, you're, you're not understanding what I'm saying. The photograph is perfectly fine. What happens when you blow up artwork though, let me pull one of these up. I'll show you a couple of examples. So this one, this is a little bit five by seven. I did, this is over for you guys on Patreon. This one was a Patreon, right? I don't think this was a live stream. I'm pretty sure that one is a lesson over on Patreon. This is a five by seven, it's tiny. Super cute when it's tiny, like he's so adorable. But when you blow him up, any given area, now you see the information, it, whoops, it doesn't matter what, how good the photo is. This is a very good photo. What matters, oops, let's, come on, I'm having a hard time getting it to grab the thing I want it to grab. There we go. What matters, nope, that was still not the right one. Crap, hold on one second. It doesn't want to grab the image so I can zoom in. Nope, there we go. Well, I can move it anyway. It just won't let me change the size much. But when you go in, Again, this was a five by seven. Look at the detailing in here, how rough that is. You can see the grain of the paper. It stops looking so good. That isn't because of a bad photo. That's a great photo. That's because the artwork was intended to be seen as a five by seven. It was not created as a bigger piece. So it does not matter. It's not pixelated. The problem isn't the photo. The problem is the artwork was not created to be looked at this big. And that's what happens a lot of it, a lot of times. People will comment that it's just an issue of the pixelation. No, that's it's not the pixelation. You can use a macro photo and get the best photo ever. It was never intended. Look how rough this is. When you look at it on a small scale, it doesn't look like that. Let me zoom back out. Now, those of you looking on your phone, it all I'm sure looked fine. This is really gonna be more in person. But I mean, when you when you zoom out, it looks like everything's smooth. It looks how it was intended to be viewed. It's a little five by seven, super cute. But when you blow it up, it it's almost like it highlights anything that wasn't smooth in your original art, anything that wasn't done well in your original art. It suddenly looks like a, a loose sketch instead of a shaded completed project. So that is what I'm talking about. This isn't a matter of if you do good enough settings on your camera, your camera can't invent what isn't in the painting. You, what you created blown up bigger does not look good. And I don't care who you are, it doesn't look good. Now, some of you who are saying, oh no, I blew mine up and it was great. Okay, you're not very picky. That it's as simple as that. And that's not an, uh, to be offensive to you, or, you know, I'm not trying to offend you, but there's a different, I am so picky on what my prints look like. That is not what I want my customer to get blown up. It just wouldn't, I wouldn't make it available. If I were to make prints of that, I mean, I'm not, but if I did make prints of it, they would be five by sevens or smaller. It'd look great on a postcard. So maybe I will make prints because that actually would make for a cute postcard. It would not look good. Suddenly it's like, oh, who did that? That artist is not very good because the quality of the art was never created to be looked at at that scale. So let me see, I've got a couple more of these. Um, and I understand, like I'm not bashing those who were arguing with me. They didn't understand I wasn't clear enough about what I was talking about. When It has nothing to do with the camera settings. The camera cannot fix what I did not include in the original. So we had that one. Let's go with, this was another one. This one was an eight by 10 or 11 by 14, I forget which. I think, oh, eight by 10, I'm pretty sure. This one is colored pencil and pan pencils or it's all colored pencil and powder blender. And I don't remember because it's been a while. But small, looks great. The larger you go, that eye doesn't look so clear anymore. The area around here, look, I didn't, couldn't even see on the original that I have a gap where the feathers don't quite touch the beak. They're just kind of floating out there. I didn't know that. I couldn't see that in the original because it's so tiny. As we look in here, it starts just looking scraggly and like 
not well done. And the art is fine. The problem is it was not created to be looked at at this scale. It was created to be looked at as an eight by 10. So when you try to make it look larger, and if you're looking at that and you're like, well, I made mine larger and it look again, you're just not as picky. Um, I have a different standard, I think, maybe because I'm old, for what I expect my work to look like if I'm going to sell that. Sorry, I know this is all weird moving around. Um, if I'm gonna sell that to a customer. But look, as we zoom this out, and it, if you're watching this on a TV, you can see what I'm talking about the best. But those who are watching on a phone, it probably all looks okay. But here's another one, like here, it looks perfectly clear. That area where I told you the feathers didn't quite touch the beak, you can't even tell when it's its original size. When you blow it up, it's like, huh, you missed some lines there, Miss Artist. So there you go, there's that one. I think I had a couple more examples. What were the other ones? So this one is an 11 by 14. This one hangs above my reef tank. Let's move, oops, I actually just did the wrong thing. Wrong, I'm having a hard time getting things to enlarge the way I want them to, there we go. So this one hangs above my, my um, reef tank. This one, the detail here, is so like, let's zoom that way out. I can go up to, or, or I'm sorry, it's a, what was it? A 30 by 40 inch. I can go so big, like I can just keep zooming out and it's going to look good because the original was intended. Look at the detail in there. No matter how big I go, it looks fine because it was so big, the detail was intended to be looked at up close like this. So no matter how much I blow that up, Anything up to 11 by 40, or I'm sorry, 11 by 40, that's another thing. 30 by 40, look at the clarity in the turtle's eye this big because the original is this big. See what I mean by the difference between this and the smaller pieces? This was intended to be seen big so I can print it big and it looks just as good as the original. It looks amazing when it's printed. Now you can always make a print smaller and it will still look good. Smaller always looks better, always. Going bigger is where your problem is. And if it's just a little bit bigger, it's not a big deal. The bigger you go, the worse that problem is going to get where you're suddenly seeing. I don't even know if I would call them mistakes. It's just that they were never intended to be seen larger than that original. So like the feathers that didn't quite hit the beak, you cannot see that on the original, not or the original size. You would almost not notice at all. Gibson, no one wants to listen to you look yourself. I certainly don't, but <laughs> that's not appropriate. But anyway, um, that's what I'm talking about. This has nothing to do with your, your camera settings will not make any difference here. They, I mean, let me back that up. There are programs. There's an AI program I use that I love. I forget what it's called, but it can take some of that, not pixelated, but like if the canvas shows, if you zoom in too much on a canvas, you'll start seeing the texture of the canvas. It'll get rid of that. It is phenomenal. So I'm really happy with, with some of that stuff, but even that's not adding detail. It's just smoothing out some of the roughness that was there. So there are, we're getting to where tech can fix some things and make it better. So maybe in the future, the AI will be able to be like, oh, let me clean that up for you. But right now, as of recording this video, that's not really a thing besides I can move out or smooth out the canvas bumps um, is about the extent of that one. But again, doesn't matter what your camera settings are. Your prints should not be made larger for prints. Now, let's say you're making a banner, like my banner for Aquashella. I've got sea turtles that are like, I don't know, 30 inches wide and I have it printed in this huge four foot by six foot banner. That looks fine because it's a banner and people are looking at it from a distance. So it's almost like so far at a distance, it's almost similar to how far they would be looking at the original painting. So it's not as harsh how bad it looks, but it, when you stand up close to that banner, it's like, whoa, that's blurry and out of focus because it wasn't intended to be look, blow, you know, viewed at that scale. So anyway, there we go. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, let me go ahead and see what questions we've got. Um, where did I put that up? Here we go. Oh, lots of questions. Okay. Let's see. Hi, Lisa, new member and loving it. Yay. If I, uh, I use a lot of acrylic, what can I, oh, what can I over paint on with the acrylic? Can acrylic go over pan pastels, watercolor, color pencil? Oh, that's actually a good question. At first I didn't understand. Then my brain reading comprehension kicked in. Okay. Um, acrylic can go over pan, uh, pan pastels. I don't know. I don't know why you'd want to though. I am not sure because pan pastels have an almost oily feel to me. So I think they would stick, but I don't know how archival that would be. I'd have to look into, I don't really know what pan pastels are made from. So 
Not sure on that one. Um, they can go over graphite. I personally don't like the look, but they can be. Go they can go over graphite. They cannot go over colored pencil because colored pencil are an oil-based medium, oil or wax-based. They have clay and some other ingredients, but that is not compatible with the water-based uh, acrylics. And a lot of people use acrylics for like white highlights. It's not intended for that and it will not last long term. So that's not archival. It'll chip off, break off, whatever. If you want white highlights with colored pencil, get a product from brushandpencil.com. It's called uh, colored pencil, titanium white, and touch up texture. My brain just completely shut down on the name. It is amazing. You mix those two together, you can get your white highlights that way. That's archival. That's meant for colored pencil, not acrylics though. Um, you had also asked for watercolor. Yes, you could put acrylics on top of watercolor because they're both water-based, so that would not be a problem at all. I'm trying to think of anything else. Those are the ones that come to the top, like, top of my head. You could paint it over uh, ink tents as well would be fine. Let's see. Art of Raven D said, despite being told to avoid Blowing my pastel dust whenever I play with them, I blow dust I blow dust, and I don't know why, including pastel with CL labels. I have no, I don't think I'm reading that right. Apparently my first pet was, oh, also said, apparently my first pet was a bunny when I was two, but I guess I stuck my finger in the cage, bit my finger, and it explains the scar that never went away. Folks gave the bunny away. Oh, poor bunny. Yeah, I'm not, toddlers, like little, little ones and certain animals are not... Like I always remember when I worked at the pet stores where people would come in with their toddlers and, or even a five-year-old, what's, what kind of bird should I get for my five-year-old? A stuffed animal? A stuffy. That is what I would go with. Like if you, birds bite. I don't care how good they are. Chicken is an awesome bird and chicken will nail me when he's being senior cranky pants and that is just what happens. And sometimes with a little one, like depending on how they jerk back or how they react, that, that may not be safe for the bird or the child. So yeah, some of the toddlers, some of the buddies, um, hamsters, we used to call, especially the teddy bear, not the teddy bear, the, uh, was it Siberian dwarf hamsters? We used to call those fuzzy covered evil. Oh my God, you may get a decent one, but uh, the teddy bears were usually a bit calmer but they bite little fingers and so people would get them thinking oh my toddler a cute little fluffy yeah they're getting bit like that's just what they typically do you may get one that isn't real bitey but um yeah anyway um Fran said, after over 30 years of being a grower in a greenhouse playing in the dirt, I cannot feel the difference between the rough and smooth side of paper. Any way besides the feel or drawing on the paper? Yes. Flip it. Look at both of them under a light. You can tell the difference. Look at the grain. The one with more grain is going to be the rough side. The smooth side is, well, it's smoother. So just like use your, your whatever light you use to paint or draw under, that light should be bright enough that you can, you can visually see it. I don't even think with the Canson Me 10s, I'm not sure if I can feel it with my fingers either because mine are more calloused as well. So yeah, I'm not just, I go visually on that. Art of Raven D said, I had an artist buddy on Twitter get his drawing taken down for copyright. The person they drawn was obviously not happy about it, nor did he ask permission in the first place. Ooh, yep, you don't, do not violate copyright. And even with doing fan art, that gets iffy. Like, I, I used to do more fan art. I don't anymore. I never found it performed super well in my videos. Although I suspect probably my timing was always off. Like I was so like years behind when the character was popular. So that's probably why. But um, hi, user error. I figured out the problem. But anyway, you never know if the company is going to be okay with fan art. Some companies encourage it, like Game of Thrones used to encourage it. Then they randomly went after some girl who had never even seen the show who titled a painting Winter is Coming because it was a winter scene and winter was coming. It was like the beginning of winter. And they went after her for copyright, by, or by, I think they may, it may have been a trademark. I forget if it was trademark or copyright they went after her for, but they wanted her pulling it down. And it's like, you can't trademark a common saint. Like it was crazy. And I'm like, especially a company that encouraged fan art. And this had nothing to do with Game of Thrones anyway, because it was a young girl who had never seen it, but it was bizarre. So I don't trust a lot of these companies. There, there have been times I really want to do fan art, but you just don't know when they're going to change their mind. And in my case, I pulled most of them off my website, or off here on YouTube, because I don't want to get hit with a copyright strike. So you never know. Um... Daphine said, I love your energy, especially knowing you also have fibro. You are inspiring. Oh, thank you. I just talk fast and I'm passionate about stuff. 
So people, it's funny you bring that up. That was always a problem for me when I would go to the doctors before I was diagnosed and were trying to figure out they didn't know I had celiac or ankylosing spondylitis. They didn't know any of the problems I have. And so they just kept dismissing it, dismissing it. And then they do the whole, well, you must be depressed. And I'm like, when you feel this crappy, of course you're a bit depressed, but like, that's not my problem. But anyway, so, but the, the, when I would tell them how tired I was, they kept giving me different medications that would make me more tired. I'm like, this makes me feel worse. I'm so tired. And they would never take me seriously because I speak so quickly. They assume that I'm not really that tired. And it's like, wow, good job on the doctor in there. Um, you ranked high in your class, didn't you? Okay. But yeah, that was always frustrating. I just talk fast. Um, it was frustrating for the doctors, not for you. I appreciate your comment. Uh, let's see. Jay said, what pencil sharpener do you use? I struggle to get sharp points on polychromos. It's their wood, like their wood cores are extra hard. So I use a couple of different ones. I've got, this one is the Coom. Oh, let's actually do it so you can see. There we go. The Coom, just like a regular metal. It's got the two different sides. Um, I use that one. Tonight I was using this cheapy, I don't even know what brand this was. Got it at some art supply store. I don't know. It seemed sharp enough. It was working for me. Okay, tonight. And then the third one that I use, let me grab that. There's a long, it's the Coombe Long Pointed Sharpener. I didn't have it out tonight, but I normally use it a lot. It will get you a super fine point, but it's only good for polychromos. I don't really like it for most of my other pencils because, there it is, it will, they're not as hard, so they tend to break. But this one here, actually, let's go back here. This one is the Coom Long Pointed Sharpener. And it's got, let me pull this out. I'll show you what it'll do. Let's do a little demonstration because it's actually a really cool sharpener. So you've got your normal side. You're going to sharpen it here first. So once you get that, probably go a little bit longer. So you've got that side, but it always leaves like a little, like it's kind of rough there. And then you go on this side, which I have a feeling it's gonna break. I think mine's clogged. There we go. But look how, can you see how long, focus. I don't know if that's focusing, but it's like a really long point compared to, let's say this one. So you can see the difference between those. This one's just my normal, this was actually just this little cheapy one I was using, but the difference, wow, that's really choppy for some reason, but you can, point is you can see the difference of the two lengths there. There we go, focus. I don't know why that camera is wanting to give us the finger. Okay, you got just under a half an hour if you wanna bid on the bunny tonight. That link is in the video description. Lily said, I hope I'm not butchering your name, but I butcher names, it's like my thing. Said, can you expand on types of papers for different mediums? I'm going shopping at Blick on Friday and would greatly suggest, uh, appreciate suggestions. Okay, good question. So, I've got a few different papers that I really like. One is the Can't Send Me Tans, that's what I'm using tonight. Let me show you my favorite. It is the Gray Pack Pastel Gray Tones. I tried the other ones, but I So it's this pack here. This one is a nine by 12, so it gives me a pretty good, I got some space in there. But look at all the pretty colors of grays. Darker and darker and darker. And there's, this one normally has black in it too, but it looks like I, I've used that up. So this one is really nice. I'll do that with pan pastels and colored pencil. Speaking of, I should put my lid back on my pan pastels. There we go. And then I can set this here. For colored pencil, let's say I'm gonna do colored pencil and I'm going to blend with OMS. My favorite, if I'm doing something super, super realistic, Arches Hot Press Watercolor Paper, hands down my go-to. If I am going to use sanded paper, so let's say colored pencil and powder blender or even colored pencil and pan pastels, if I want sanded paper, the only one that I use is Lux Archival because it is the only sanded paper that is archival on front and back. UART says that theirs is archival, but only the front, the back is not acid free which you would think, well, it's the back, who cares? Because it soaks through to the front. And I've seen this on some of mine that was, were stored, like in the pack that it came in, the backs of the one side made the acid in it, it affected the front of the other new sheets of paper because they were touching. 
because that's how that stuff works. So yeah, and they're really, I don't know, I think that company is shady as heck because they try talking crap about any artist who pointed out, hey, it's not archival in the back, it doesn't matter. We've got work that's been in here for 20 years and it's not faded, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, fine. But you're making a claim that it is completely archival when it clearly is not on the back. Your product is only archival on the front and you don't make that clear to artists. I would never have purchased that product had they been clear about that it wasn't really fully archival. So, and they're actually the people who own it. They are just kind of nasty the way they treat customers who have questioned that, the way that they talk about us, like we're the artists who have questioned it, how dumb we are. And like, they're really, I've not been impressed with what I've seen on how they talk about customers that question it. Like that company, I would never give money to again. Anyway, um, super shady. So that was my opinion there. But the Lux Archival is archival front and back. You can get that from Brush and Pencil. And I think Blick has it as well. I don't know if they have it in store, but I believe it's on their website. So that would be it for sanded paper. And the sanded paper I use with Pan Pastels and Colored Pencil or Powder Blender from Brush and Pencil as well and Colored Pencil. Um, what else? For canvases, let's see, did you say what mediums? You said paper specifically. Um, pencil for graphite, I also like Arches Hot Press Watercolor Paper, but graphite I'm not as picky about as some of the others. So there's actually a Strathmore, like an old, it was one of the older Strathmore, Canson has a bunch that are decent too. There's any of them that are smooth. I don't like Bristol paper. That Bristol or Bristol vellum, it's too smooth. And so even with graphite, I feel like I just can't get my darks quite dark enough. So not my favorite there. But again, Arches Hot Press Watercolor Paper, I like for colored pencil. I like it for watercolor. I like it for ink tents. It's just my go-to paper for so many things. Canson Me Tens, I love for Pan Pastels. I like it for colored pencil. I like it for charcoal. Love it for charcoal. What else? I think those would be my top ones that I would have, I would recommend. That was a good question. I don't think we've had that, quite that question. Um, Terry said, beautiful job. I love watching your techniques. Thank you. Jason said, Lisa, when you first started out, would you recommend Schwint, Schwinting uh, when, oh, I think that's squinting when looking at the reference to, to better define the larger shapes and not focus on the details until later? Yeah, I don't find I squint until, I know what you mean with the squinting thing. I typically do that when I'm working on my piece where I'm like, is it all balanced? Seriously, I freaking love this bunny. I'm so like tickled is a good word with how he came out. Uh, I just aged myself, didn't I? I sound like my grandma. I'm so tickled. Anyway, um, so I lost track of the thing because I got all, uh, what was the question? <laughs> oh my God. No, I don't find when I'm drawing it, I squint so much. I, I do that more once I'm further into the work. And that's a personal personal thing. I would, I'm not saying that if you squint while you're doing your drawing, you're wrong. That actually makes sense that that would work well for a lot of people. It doesn't for me, just the way that I draw it. I just, I do it loosely anyway. So I think I'm just seeing it loosely. So I don't need to squint there. I squint at the end once I've got the detail in when I'm trying to see if I've got my balance of lights and darks and all that because the detail's getting in my way. So, I mean, it makes sense that that technique would work, but I don't personally. Uh, let's see, Rebecca said, I need to learn the best way to have prints made of my artwork. I have no idea how to do this. So I actually have a couple of videos here on YouTube that walk through getting the photo, getting good photos of your work and getting where I have my prints made. But just real quick, I can tell you Vista Print is where I have postcards. I've had, that's where I've been getting my stickers. I do wanna try a sticker mule and a few others that I was talking to somebody, another artist about that she uses. But Vista Print has been great for like postcard style things, um, cards, greeting cards, that sort of thing for print, like G clays, G clay today is what I use. They take forever. That is not a fast process, but their quality I like. It always looks a little bit darker, it, um, the print does than what the original was, but it always looks better than, to me, the darker always, I see that, I'm like, wow, it's better than the original was. But I love how those come out. And with them, I use Moab Natural Paper, and then they've got multiple sizes you can use. Again, don't go larger than your original. So those are like really good. And then Fine Art America is another way you can go. Fine Art America, the thing I like about them is it's a drop ship. So if somebody buys it, they buy it through, I don't have to be involved other than uploading the image. I get sent like my portion of the markup of the print and um, Fine Art America takes care of everything, including like, let's say it was damaged in shipping. Fine Art America takes care of that. Fine Art America, what? what? Fine Art America takes care of that. And suddenly I developed a weird accent and you don't like, I don't have time to deal with that sort of thing. So that's a really, really nice bonus there with them. Good luck though, if you ever need to get a hold of their customer service. 
Apparently customers don't have a hard time. It's the artists that have a hard time getting a hold of them. Okay. Um, and then for getting photos, I do my photos with a DSLR. I've used a scanner, never like the results I get. For small things, it's okay, but just a good DSLR. And then again, watch that video because I show you how I take photos of that. Um, if you just Google Lacree and art prints, it should come out. They're up. Thelma says, it's so good to see your live streams again. Yay. JT said, great live stream. How do you get all the excess paint buildup off your easel, um, easel shelf? So that's actually a really good question. I will show you. I put shelving paper. This is all just shelving paper. And when this gets built up too much, I just peel it off. You can kind of see, well, kind of the corners coming up over here. I just peel it off and put a new sheet on. And then I did the same thing. I've got my shelf down here, same thing. That's just um, every so often I take that off and put a new sheet on. So that's like just cheapy shelving paper that I picked up at Amazon. Works so well. I used to take a razor blade and just like a rig, I just threw it on the floor. Where did my razor blade go? Um, I should find that before I step on that. That would be unpleasant, especially the way it was just sitting. But I would take a razor blade and just scrape the paint off, but you start to cut into the wood, so that's not ideal. So when I got this easel, knowing this is like my forever easel, I shouldn't ever have to replace this. So I went with the shelving paper, I just cut it to fit, and it, it's worked really well. Um, let's see. Just under 20 more minutes to bid on the bunny. Michael said, stay with Picky. I think many of us have learned from you that we must make our products as archival and perfect as possible. Thank you. Yeah, I am picky, that is for sure. Well, and part of me being so picky, so going back, there's a hair that is tickling the top of my nose. Um, going back years ago, so this would have been like 2000, 2001. I had first started painting with oil painting, uh, or paints, I was poor oh my gosh and I thought um, I'm not like exaggerating either I thought a good way to save money I needed linseed oil I would go to the hardware store and buy that linseed oil that's not the same thing as it turns out and I used it and it seemed fine at the end and then a few months go by and I had sold several at an art show a few months go by and some of those paintings they were smaller 11 by 14s or 10, 8 by 10 so part of me is like it wasn't like the people had spent more than $60 but still, because it was real cheap back, like I sold it for really cheap back then. They were like orcas and stuff. But a few of them that were hanging on my own wall after the fact, a few months, maybe six months go by, it yellowed, but it also beat it up. Like it started forming these drip lines. Like it was weird because that's not how it was when it dried. I mean, months later, this started happening. And to this day, so that was, you know, we're over 20 years later. I still feel horrible and guilty about that. So I'm very, that's why I'm so picky about things being archival and looking good. I don't like knowing I sold something to people. There's no way they can hang them on their wall anymore. And if they were watching, you show me a photo of that, I will replace it with my current quality and it will be good. But I, it was a, a show at Catalina Island is where I had sold them in California. But, and there weren't that many of them, but I still feel terrible about it. Like I am, I, I want, if you buy something from me, I want it to be good. I want you to really be happy with it in long term. So yeah, that's where I learned that lesson. And it still feels bad. Um, let's see. Jason said, can you add definition after enlarging the picture on a computer to fill in the changes of the reference? Yeah, you certainly could. Um, wait, to fill in the changes in the reference. Do you, okay, I'm not sure. Do, what, Jason, there is something about the way we communicate. I never know what you're talking about, and I know it's me, it's not you. Anyway, I think what you're asking is about the prints. So you could, let's say I wanted to enlarge that and add detail and like do digital painting over it, you certainly could do that. You could clean that up, you could fix things, you absolutely, I mean, anytime that I make prints, I'm always Photoshopping it anyway to make it look as much like the original as possible. So that is a potential thing that you could do, but is it worth it? I mean, why not just make the original the size that you wanted the print to be anyway? Um, you're essentially painting over again if you have to make that level of, do that much work to correct everything that would need it. Uh, Dale said, uh, um, let's see, rely on your advice so often. Thank you. Can you suggest how to draw profiles of people? Trace them. And I don't mean so that you don't learn, like that, that comes out, that's overly simplified. 
But yes, trace them. Trace it, let's say 10 times. Take, find a portrait, a, a profile of a person and trace it. Now, after that, I want you to freehand it. The same, the same drawing, now freehand it. You, in the act of tracing it, you start forcing your brain to notice what's there. We have a tendency when we first start drawing, our brain is like, I don't know what a person looks like, I see them all the time. And it's like, and here's a nose and it really looks like a car. So you don't, don't trust your brain. Try tracing it several times and then freehand it. And then trace it again and then freehand it. You will start getting your brain to see things accurately. You force it to see things accurately and this will improve your, your freehanding skills so fast. Now my goal is not for you to depend on tracing. I want you to improve your freehanding skills because that's important and when you start painting, I don't care if you trace something or not, if you can't draw, it's obvious once you start painting or filling in the color and such because you haven't trained yourself to notice the detail yet. So trace it, trace it, trace it and then freehand it. Then trace it some more and then freehand it some more. That will help you to improve your drawing skills and start forcing your brain to see what's really there versus what it thinks is there. So that is my advice there. And practice drawing from live models is also helpful, but the same thing, if you've traced it a few times, once you start, and it uses a little bit of a different part of your brain, so you have to, to get the hang of that, but that will also be helpful. Uh, let's see, Scott said, I'm an oil and acrylic painter these days, but I used to draw all the time when I was younger. All of your work inspires me to get back into other mediums. I'm learning from you, thank you. That is awesome, yay. Brittany said, why would some people tell me not to use a reference photo to create art? I've had at least one adult tell me not to use a reference photo to help me create art, even though it's acceptable to, it is acceptable to do in art school. Because they, <laughs> it's just, God, it's an ongoing rant of mine. It's BS is what it is. I mean, let's just be real. It, it's, it's terrible advice because for some reason, someone got in their head, if you can draw without a reference photo, you're a better artist. That's not how we do it. If you're doing photorealism, you're working from a photo. I don't care if you're an animator. I don't care if you're painting portraits. I don't care what medium you're working in. I do not care what you do and how good you think you are. You're using a reference photo if you actually want the work to be any good. If you're going from your memory, you're doing something very, very stylized. But even the people who do things that are stylized, they still use multiple reference photos. You're still using photos. The people who are like, don't use a photo. You're, you're going to be better without it. What? Because that's not a thing. You're like, why are you making stuff up? That, that was something that was made up. Speaking of made up, my God, I've been watching some videos this week. The amount of made up advice is just insane. I watched a video this week where the guy was telling you with acrylic painting, you know how when we watercolor, we have two separate cups of water. I use distilled water. One is for rinsing my brush, one is for adding water to thin the paint. Dude was telling people you needed to do that for acrylics. No, you don't. Your acrylic water for rinsing your brush and thinning the paint can be dang near mud and be perfectly fine. It does not really affect acrylics. Now, when you get into glazing, you may wanna go dump your water and clean it if it's like thick and, and really muddy. But I mean, it can be brown water and like totally fine. So yeah, cause just the, the nature of acrylics and, and all of that. So there are some videos on there and I think that's what happens. You get these people that, that just make stuff up so they can make a video and it sounds all like, look at how much I know you, the five things you must do as an acrylic painter, but you made it all up. Like mo that one video I, I'm talking about, made up, don't add water, because he would have heard that from somebody else. Don't add water to your acrylics because it underbinds it and blah, blah, BS. That's not true. You can add all, up to 90 to 95% water to acrylics before it would impact it negatively. So not a problem. What was one of the other bits of advice? Oh, you needed to, to gesso canvases even if they're already gessoed. If I buy a canvas from, from Fredericks, I know it's got the best gesso on there, the best possible, because they use the best of the best of everything. I don't need to gesso it again unless I want to smooth it out and then sand it down. That would be different. So yeah, I watched some videos this week and I'm watching the advice that people are giving them and it's like, wait, you're taking advice from watercolor and you're trying to apply it to acrylics except it doesn't apply to acrylics. I mean, no, I won't say that, that's just mean. But um, yeah, it's oh, some of the advice out there and the advice of not using a reference photo, it's the same thing. Some random person made it up and it's just not true. And then other people ran with it. So yeah, it's like one of those myths that people have in their head that they paint from what they feel and it's, it's just BS. Okay, next. 10 minutes to bid on the bunny. 
I had to look at it to remember it was a bunny. Brain shut down again. Um, Karina said, I'm having trouble finding the Me 10's toned paper. My supplier can't get it now. I found large sheets, but no pads. This is in Australia and New Zealand. So you can get the large sheets and just cut it down into the size you want. Um, that's what I used to do with when I got Fabriano Artistico back when that was good. It's not anymore. I would get the huge sheets and just cut it into four pieces for 11 by 14s. And you can go that way then. Um, Brittany said, have you heard that Derwent came out with 28 new colors of the Inktense pencils, bringing the lineup to 100? I saw something about their Inktense. I have not talked to Derwent in so long. They changed, like, the, the my contact person isn't there, I don't think, anymore. So, yeah, I'll have to contact them. Dolphin Soul said, does Pan Pastel and pencils photograph well for prints? They do. I like the Spectrafix because... Um, uh, will the, sorry, can't talk. Will the Spectrafix cause any glossiness? No, it's completely matte, photographs beautifully, very accurate. I think that's part of why this guy is so, like, this is what it looks like in person. That is accurate. And I think it's just pan pastels. It looks good on camera, whether it be a photograph or in this case, the webcam, like that is seriously accurate. Surprisingly so, because usually they're not, but they're very easy to photograph. Art from Brave and D said, about the lady who said water will ruin acrylic. I have an acrylic painting I did almost 20 years ago in high school that is still in great condition. Water was used. She's full of it. Oh, she's absolutely full of it. I mean, uh, Golden's has done testing, like actual testing, not her little honeycomb theory. Let's make up some more things. Um, I think the thing why I'm so bitter about that one, people are wrong. People make mistakes. I, I will be wrong about things. I will make mistakes. But when you had to turn off the comments because people pointed out you were wrong and you're like, Psh, I get enough views on this video. It's one of the top ranking acrylic va painting videos still. It's like 12 years old and it's still 10, 12 years old. Still ranks top. She turned off the comments. To me, that's just dishonest. That's saying, I don't care if I'm spreading misinformation. I don't care what other information has come out. I just want, I want the views. Now she left the comments on. I would think she just believes what she believes. She was just, you know, whatever. No, you turn the comments off. Now I just think you're shady. Um, that's harsh. But seriously. Okay. Are we caught up? And yeah, I mean, I've got paintings. I've been painting with acrylics for 30 something years. I mean, I'm old. I've been doing this a long time. I was a teenager. Yeah, with 30 years and none of mine have been a problem. And that's not just me, that's nobody. Like we all, all use water in our acrylics. It's fine. Um, let's see, got a few more minutes, eight minutes on the bunny. Um, yeah, pan pastels are extremely pigmented to photo. Or they photo, so photo well for it. Yeah, they're very pigmented. Okay, let's see how that bunny is doing. Um, let's pull that up. Okay, it does have the thing, so you can have it um, matted if you want me to do it. Six minutes and nine seconds. There's a countdown. Oh, I can't see who the bidders are. It just gives me the first and the last right now. I'd have to actually log in. I'm not gonna do that, I'm lazy. Okay. Um, almost done. Oh, make sure you check out our moderator's channels. Links are in the video description. They help so much. Yeah, I, Joseph said, I'd rather give no advice than bad advice if you see me stream, and this is obvious. No, and you know, that was one of the things, especially earlier on when I was doing videos, I was hesitant to tell people what I knew because it's like somebody, someone is always going to disagree and tell you you're wrong. That's fine. But I, I was surprised at how much bad information is out there in these videos. Bad technique, bad like, you know, so, just some of the more popular acrylic paintings right now are like, look, I used a fork and it looks like you used a fork. It doesn't look good. Um, although I kind of want to do something like that in a video just for fun, but it's, yeah, you've just got a lot of weird advice and technique. I mean, it's art, have fun, do what you want to, that's fine. My issue is when somebody should know better, like the lady with just giving that level of advice and 
acting like you're just such an expert on. You must do this. You must do that. You must. Um, one of the bits of advice the one guy gave about misting the back of your canvas while you painted would actually potentially hurt the canvas to be keeping it wet that long. You're loosening it up. You don't want to do that. You, you spray the back of the canvas if you need to tighten it back up. You don't want to do that and then keep it wet while you're painting. Especially if you put three or four coats of gesso on it, it's not soaking through. Like that's not doing anything. You're just making it up. And I mean, it's kind of genius in an evil genius way because it's like you're 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 giving people information they've never heard before because it's wrong and it's not real that's why they've never heard it before so yeah it's just oh my gosh um let's see what was the change with fabriano artistico hawk press that changed the way you feel about it so and this sucks because i met one of the main guys with them at a art convention thing and i loved him he was so nice it was an older guy so nice wanted to do like work with me do some videos and stuff but they had changed it and they at the time they started printing money i believe on their presses their their like paper thing they insisted it wouldn't have changed the watercolor paper but it did everyone who used it noticed the change so it wouldn't take as many layers anymore it was almost like the pencil would just kind of float on top instead of soaking in when i'd use oms so it was definitely different watercolor artists because watercolor artists they're more picky like you have to be more picky about all of that with paper especially with watercolor and they noticed it so a lot of them stopped using it and then i heard i've not bought it since like i use i still have some here so you may occasionally see me do a video with it because i still have some but i won't buy more it's okay it's not unusable but like why would i use that if i could just use arches i i like arches is more like what fabriano was to me very similar what it used to be but they changed it again i hear that it's even weirder now so i don't know what they did but it just doesn't behave the same is it usable yes if you've got some use it you can create beautiful beautiful work on it but i feel like at least for me and my techniques arches is a better fit so and it sucks because i really liked the guy i spoke with this was years ago but the guy who was there with with um fabriano was so nice and i loved him and i would have liked to work with him but i just can't i won't recommend something that i'm not come like that i'm not super behind so it's why you don't see me do a lot of product reviews i am contacted constantly by people wanting me to review their brushes wanting me to review all of these different things and it's like unless i've used it and unless i genuinely like it myself i'm not going to recommend it so it's like it's not even worth the trouble of getting into so i i typically don't do like a lot of the sponsored content because of that uh let's see oh gracious said i wish i could <coughs> could afford the bunny right now my daughter would love the bunny uh is the reference photo going to be one of the april photos on patreon it's already available go over to my website you can get this you can draw it yourself so you can draw one for your daughter um but it's already over there on my website so that is right there uh, Art of Raven D said, Arches is great, but then I went vegan four years ago. Yeah, I'm very, I'm more keto, so definitely not there. Um, yeah, that, that is, they do use a, oh, what is it called? Gelatin, ge they use, some, yeah, I know what you, what you mean. Uh, Michael said, the Facebook, Arti uh, the fa Facebook, the Fabriano Artistico paper does not work with watercolor as well as Arches. I have a lot of new um, 30 by 22. That sucks because they were such a good paper before. Gelatin sizing, thank you. I knew, I was just reading about this recently, so, but apparently didn't retain all of the information. So one more minute on the bunny, and this will get shipped out. And whoever, if you're watching right now, the person who won the B, it's, where did I put it? It's varnished, I'm gonna get that shipped with this at the same time. I always wait a week on the varnish, the acrylic paintings, because it's, the varnish is a little bit tacky, it's a little bit sticky, and I'm always afraid, like, is it really dry all the way? Because it's gonna get pressed between cardboard, like, really tight. It'll have glassine in front of it, but it gets pressed so tight, I'm like, I need to make sure that, that that varnish is completely dry, so that's why that always takes a little bit longer for me to, to send. Did I get the paper stretchers? I did, let me show you. Oh my gosh, you guys can have a preview. It, they are, I am pretty happy like really happy. Where did I, let me get the one part, smaller one. So I got three different, or no, four different sizes. The big one had to be moved somewhere else because it's 
but I was like, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. So these are the, for stretching the, whoop, nope, wrong button, stretching the paper. This board has, oh, I don't wanna scratch you. Scooch bunny, there we go. See, it has these thick bars in there and they will come off with this little tool. You just unscrew that to loosen it up. So you would get the paper wet. I need to get um, something to soak the paper in. But you get the paper wet, then you take all of these off, you set the paper down after it's soaked, and then you put these back on and it tightens. You can really see here how it's the two pieces. There you go. It's the two pieces there and it will tighten that in place so that the, um, you're not having to deal with gum tape. You're not having to deal with staples. You're not having to deal with any of that. Now I've not used them yet besides, because I need to, get buckets or tray things to soak my um, paper in. But this, I'm really happy with, like I think this is gonna work super well. And they're not like, hold on, let me put this back together. Come on, there we go. They're not like, I mean, you've got, oh, the wrong thing. There we go. They've got little gaps and stuff, but you don't need that. They're smooth. They're gonna hold that paper down to dry where you need it that is overexposed. But yeah, these I'm super, super happy with. Um, definitely, I think these are gonna be worth the, I mean, just seeing what they do right now, I definitely think they're going to be worth what I paid for. I think for all four sizes that he makes, um, this one I think is the mini, I forget what size that one is. And he goes all the way up to like the biggest, the big, big sheets and then if you want to go with the big one you just cut one big paper after it's been stretched into smaller ones but for all four of them was 275 dollars but seeing these and seeing how much time that will save me i won't stretch it if i have to use gum ta tape i hate gum tape i i have it but it's like it doesn't work as often as it does so um if i'm gonna stretch paper these are nice i i'm i'm very excited with that purchase okay it looks like the bunny is Done. I always hate when it sends the email because it doesn't show me who bid. I'm just curious. But thank you for whoever bid on him. I will show you again one more time what you just won. Um, there we go. Look at that bunny. Like that is just, he came out so cute. I'm like super super excited with how he came out. Anyway, thank you guys for joining. We will be here. I don't know what I'm doing next week. I've put zero thought into that. I've got to figure that out. I do know though, I'm starting a new um, lesson for Patreon, Surreal Landscape. This one is going to have a car, um, like an old broken down car. I have some elements. I'll talk to you about how I'm gonna design it for that video. I'll be making a YouTube version too, but that one probably will be a month before that's up. So anyway, I'm really excited. I've not done a Surreal Landscape in a very long time. So even if you don't like the Surreal aspect of it, just do it as a landscape. Like, so um, that will be in acrylics. Very excited about that. Thank you guys for joining. And let's see, I think that's it. Check out our moderator's channel. Link is in the video description. Um, is that all? I feel like that's all. I think that's all. There's something else and I don't know what it is. Anyway, thank you. I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Hey, you. Yes, you. I see all your unused art supplies over there. Oh my God, those brushes aren't even opened yet. Tragic. You keep buying new fancy materials, but you don't use them because you don't want to waste them. Stop making your art supplies sad. Sign up for art lessons for as little as $4 a month. There are over 300 painting and drawing lessons available when you sign up and new ones every week. Patreon.com slash Lockery. Go lay down. You're not supposed to be up. Good boy.